Well, good morning. Good morning. I am glad to be back here at the Frank Primitive Baptist Church and to be among God's people here with as we're gathering. Y'all might notice I've got a hymnal in my hand. It's not that I can't put it down, and it's not that I'm going to sing. But as we were singing that hymn, Lily of the Valley, uh, in the second stanza, it has this, this sentence. I have for him, I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn from my from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. That just struck me this morning because it I hope by the close of the message that it will be included, all inclusive. But I am thrilled to be back here and uh I reckon right now is an opportune time to tell y'all thank you uh, for allowing me to come and to also tell you thank you for your kindness the last time we were here when Susan ended up in the emergency room and then getting discharged the next day with the instructions to go see a cardiologist and pulmonologist. Well, it's I think that was when you went on oxygen, wasn't it, Susan, shortly after that? And she's also taking a little something now for uh, her heart to, to, uh, because of a thyroid problem. So <laughs> you never know what's going to turn up. And I'm not going to even tell you my problem. <laughs> I may not have should have told you hers, but she'll let me know later. <coughs> but I am glad to be here. And I pray God's blessings upon you as we've gathered here. The other day I was... Uh, I don't remember what store I had gone to, but I had passed by one of the buildings of some of our old line brethren. And I've passed by that church a hundred, maybe a thousand times in my lifetime there in Statesboro. And I have actually attended some services there. But I passed by it and blinked. So I turned around and went back. Because something about their sign caught me off guard. I don't know why it caught my eye that time. But the sign read, the church at Lower Mill Creek. And as I sat there reading it, I said, you know, I've seen another sign that reads a little differently. And, it, and the sign that I, oh, I can't remember which church it was, but the sign read, meeting house of whatever church it was, and I kind of like that phrase. But that, that's what it said instead of just saying, uh, say, for example, Better Primitive Baptist Church. And that's what, how a lot of churches identify themselves on their signs. Now, I don't know how many churches use church at or meeting house, to describe their buildings, but it's sort of rang a bell of truth to me. Because we all know that the congregation is actually the church. The building is not the church. But the obviousness of this sign at that location was clear. They, in, their, in their way of stating it, they were saying, this building is not the church, but this church, this building is where this particular group of people of God come to or come together as a church to worship the one true and living God. Am I implicating any type of change needs to be done to anybody's church sign? No, I am not. That church, how they designate themselves, how uh, they what they put on their sign is their business, not mine. Besides that, most churches or, or most people know that the church, church of Jesus Christ is a spiritual body of people. And they know that every firstborn child of God is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is trying to tell the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, and this is my text, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verses 15 through 20, 
as he gives them instructions, or, and these instructions are on to us, in the care of the temple of the God, our bodies. Now, my title of, the, of, of my message this morning is Your Body, God's Temple. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, he saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth, sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. Will you pray with me again? Most gracious God, our Father which art in heaven, Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we come to you, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts that we are able to come and be in your house this day. I thank you, Lord, again, that I have the privilege of being here at the Frank Primitive Baptist Church and pray your blessings upon her. Father, we continue to confess our need. We need you in spirit. We need your, your blessings in the world. So, Father, this morning, I would ask that you would continue to bless us in the spirit, that, that Lord, those who have special needs, Father, whether they be of the body, the mind, or the spirit, I pray that you will be with them and that you would heal them and comfort them according to their need and your will. Father, there have been some I've been hearing who are praying for rain, the others who are praying for, for that the weather might remain dry. Lord, I, I just pray your will be done in that. But Lord, continue with us and bless us as we gather here that we might lift up your precious and holy name and that we might praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our brother. And it's in that name we pray. And amen. Now somehow, even today, some of God's saved people have the idea that if they are saved, what they do in their bodies has no effect upon them spiritually. Well, I beg to differ. Because if Jesus died for me and the Holy Spirit has born me again, God lives within me. Therefore, anything I say, anything I do, anywhere I go, anything that touches me or anything that affects me, in effect, touches God through me. Now, I want you to look back at verse 19 of our text for just a moment. I want to look at the word temple. Paul writes there, he says, What? Know ye not? Don't you know? Don't you know that your temple, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Now, if I'm understanding this correctly, Paul is, I'll use the word comparing, our bodies to the Holy of Holies. You know, the Holy of Holies, it was, that was in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, that was in the temple that Solomon built. And then the one that Ezra and, and, and Haggai built. But he's comparing our bodies to that holy of holies, wherein God dwelt, in that God dwell, dwells within us. So Paul is stressing to those at Corinth that their bodies were God's temple. Now why is he doing that? And it, and it may be hard for us to, to picture this today. It's hard for me to picture it. 
But in this pagan city of Corinth, there was a temple of Diana. And Diana was the goddess of sex and loves to the Greeks. And I have read that in that temple at any time, there might be as many as a thousand female priestesses. So Corinth was not a small city. But these priestesses, in truth, they were nothing but prostitutes. But the catch I'm looking for here is that in order to worship Diana, one of these priestesses had to be engaged. And this had been going on there for hundreds of years. And it was quite, quote unquote, normal to the Corinthians. Now, Paul is addressing those who, who, those who had turned to Christ, but unfortunately still abided in this lifestyle. They were very incorrect in feeling that even those that since their immortal souls had been saved, their bodies were different. Their mindset was, what I do with my body has no effect on me spiritually. Beloved, they were 180% or 180 degrees away from the truth. What we do in our bodies does affect us spiritually. What we do in our bodies, if we are the children of God, will not cause us to lose our salvation. It did not cause them to lose their salvation. But I've got news for you. God is patient. God is also jealous. And being a jealous God and a God who loves his children, he will chastise those whom he loves. Now, when God gave Solomon the plans for the temple, or Moses the plans for the tabernacle, and later on gave Solomon the plans for the temple, God's plans were specific. They were specific for both of them. Those, those plans were detailed. And those plans call for the purity of materials that were going to be used, that were going to be used in con the construction of it. And God demanded this. Or he would not come into that, 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 that building, that uh, tabernacle would not see his glory. Now we know that the, the, the uh, Jews in both cases built according to God's specifications because his glory did come down in the tabernacle. His glory did come down into the temple. In John chapter 17 and verse 23, Jesus prayed this. I and them... Thou and me. He's praying to the Father. Saying, Father, I am in those whom you have given me. And Father, you are in me. That we all might be made one. Let me read that correctly. I am them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one. So in essence, he's telling us that we have been filled, that we have been filled, that we have been made one with God, filled with the Holy Ghost of God, and that we are new creatures in Christ. Sadly, though, that's all great news that, I, that I've just given you, but all of, a, all of a sudden, I'm saying sadly, though, we are still sinners. And there have been times, and might still have be times, when our spirit-filled bodies will not be bringing glory to God. So the challenge to us is that we must remember that our bodies are the temples of God. Now what I would like to do today is show, is show some comparison 
between our bodies and the temple of God. And I say use temple instead of tabernacle. And I want to reference the one that Solomon built because the one that Ezra and, and Haggai rebuilt was not up to the same one that Haggai, I mean that Solomon built. So we began to look at Solomon's temple. This was a building dedicated totally to God and his glory. Nothing that would taint it would be allowed there. And God would punish and did punish those who brought in what was polluted. We look at Leviticus chapter 10. Looking at verses 1 and 2. The high priest's sons offered strange fire unto the Lord. And they were struck down. We read a little further down in, in Leviticus, uh, Levit Leviticus 10. We find that these same men had also been guilty of drunkenness before the Lord. They were drunk. They, they, they offered strange fire. They offended God in a place which was set apart for God and His glory. Now our bodies, remember that in our bodies that the Holy Spirit dwells. And we are set apart for the praise and for the glory of God just as the temple that Solomon built. We have no right to use our bodies for anything except glorifying God. Why not? Beloved, we have all been bought with a price. Christ the Lord went, he shed his blood, he went to the cross, and he paid our sin debt. <clears throat> and it's by his grace that we have been, we have been entered into a covenant with God. It was created for us, uh, this covenant was created in order that we might have a relationship with God. God's promise to us is that he will love us, that he will keep us, that he will provide for us, and that he will provide for us an eternal home in heaven, prepared for, for us by Jesus. <clears throat> so it is to us it is to us who love our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to give up all claims to our bodies and give up all claims to the desires of this world and to dedicate our, our bodily temple to His because we are His. We are His. We don't belong to ourselves. 1 Corinthians 10 31 tells us what's. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's part of our purpose to do to the all to the glory of God. Continuing to look at Solomon's temple, it was dedicated as a place of worship. And it was a place of devotion. The people gathered there to glorify God. They came to sing psalms. They came praying. They came shouting with joy. They came lifting up their hands in praise as they sought to magnify Jehovah. Our bodies, brothers and sisters, as the abode of the Holy Ghost, are to be devoted to the worship of God. As we look at the actions of the Corinthian believers, think back to where it was a while ago, we see that they had split devotion. They were devoted to Diana in one way, they were devoted to Christ in another. They would profess a belief in Christ with their mouths, yet they could not or had not completely turned their backs on their worship of, of Diana. And they continued to bodily participate in the sensual, sinful worship of it. Now Jesus 
when he had met the woman at the well in John chapter 4, tells her that we are supposed to worship in spirit and in truth. So how do we show our, or so, so how do we worship? How do we show our devotion with our bodies? I've got a few ways I want to share with you. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Y'all remember the acronym WWJD? What would Jesus do? Jesus presented his body a living sacrifice for us. And we should be willing to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. So WWJD tells us that that's how we should be living. That should be our standard of living. That we should be ready. That just as Christ sacrificed his body for us, we should be willing to sacrifice our bodies for him. Paul tells us then in Hebrews 13 and 5, let your conversation, conversation doesn't mean talk. Well, it includes talk. But conversation is, is talking about our way of life. What would Jesus do? This would be our way of life, to do as Jesus would do. Okay, let me read the verse. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake, him, forsake ye. So let us remember that the Holy Spirit is one within us and we should be walking as if Jesus were walking physically walking with us. He would be walking right next to us. I should be trying to preach this morning as if Jesus is over here on my left or on my right. He's why he watches, knowing that he watches us while we're out in the world. This is how we are to practice his presence. We are not to be engaging in actions that would dishonor his presence and holy name. I'm not going to elaborate on some of these other ways. I'm just going to read a text. But in Jeremiah 33 and 3, we are to show our devotion to God by calling on Him in prayer. And Jeremiah writes, it says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And then in Romans 6 and 13 and also Joshua 24, verse 15, these verses call on us to choose to use our bodies in our devotion to him in his, in, in his service. I want to read from Joshua. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land she dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Athenians had a choice. Not the Athenians, the uh, Corinthians. The Athenians probably did too. And we have a choice. Joshua had a choice and he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've got one other way of that I want to mention of how we can show our devotion in our bodies. And that is that we're to be praising the Lord continually. We're to let nothing keep us from having a thankful heart of praise before God. Paul tells or the tells the Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 15. It says, 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Not half-heartedly, not half the time, continually. That is, that the fruit of our, our lips giving thanks to his name. When the people would come to the temple, they would come. Well, you, why do you come here this morning? You came here for a specific purpose, right? You came for a specific purpose. There was no difference when the people when the people would come into the temple. Into the temple, they came for a specific purpose. They would come to offer sacrifices and, and offerings. They would come to bring their tithes. They would come to, to pray and offer thanksgiving and praise. Beloved, this was their duty as commanded by the Lord. So the temple was a place of performing your duties. For us, in our fleshly bodies, we have the same duty might be our bodies, but they're God's temple and there are certain things that need to go on in God's temple. Paul continuously referred to himself as a servant of God and Jesus Christ and unto men. Now we know that Paul had been appointed as an apostle of Jesus Christ and he was to carry out those duties given to him by God. And he did so joyfully and willingly. Looking a little further back in Saul, at, at Saul's life, we remember that Saul was on the fast track up in the hierarchy of the Jews. Yet when he, after he met Jesus, he counted all that he had had before his dome. Philippians 3 and 8. After meeting Jesus, he made a conscious resolution to be the bondservant of Christ. He gave up all claims to the sensual attractions of the world. He sought not only to be nothing more than what God had called him to do and to be. <clears throat> that was his specific purpose, to be, do, be and to do what God had called him to do. Now what was he called? He was called to preach under the manifestation of the Spirit, and he was also called to write these epistles that we hold so dear, and he wrote them under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So the pinky finger points to us. Are we carrying out the duties that are, that are ours in our fleshly temple. And there's so many areas of duty. Witnessing, worship, prayer, tithing, obedience, hold, being holy, living in righteousness. And there may be many others. So I ask. I'm not going to ask you. I ask them, am I carrying out all of my duties? And I'm going to give you an answer. No, I do not carry out all of my duties as I should. I get some of them done. Some of them I don't do. If the Lord will and will help me, I'll try to do better. But the tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the rebuilt temples were all places of death. We really think about it. We watch, watch all of the sacrifices of the different animals there. And it's estimated that millions of animals were sacrificed there at God's command. So it when, when there, even though the people came to praise and pray and worship. The temple was a scene of death. 
Look at 2 Chronicles 7 and 5. And King Solomon offered, now listen to these numbers, a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen. That's 2,200 oxen. And 120,000 <coughs> sheep. 120,000. So the king and all the people dedicated to the house of God. So beloved, when we come into our church buildings, we are coming into a place of sacrifice and death. We come sadly realizing and remembering the afflictions of our Savior. Remember that he shed his blood and that he died on that cross. But we also come joyfully because we've got something else that's good to remember. And that is his glorious resurrection and his ascension. And all that he has, that, that by his death and ascension that has been done for us. So brothers and sisters, we have been called to be dead to the world. But we are not commanded to be dead in the world. Peter wrote in chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, beloved, being born again, we've been quickened by the Holy Spirit. We are new creatures in Christ, and we are to be dead to our old ways. And like Paul, count them as done. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1, well actually it's 5 through 9, gives us a list, but I wanted to read, begin reading in verse 1, because we're in that also we see that we are one with Christ. And then he goes on and gives us the, that which we should not do, that we should be dead to. Beginning in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And now we're going to begin that list where that we're to be dead to. He continues writing, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. He writes this to Corinth. Corinth probably had the same problem that, that uh, Colossians had. No, this is written to the church of Colossia. And they probably had, still had the problems that uh, uh, those at Corinth had. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. This is our commandment. To put it very bluntly, our commandment is that our bodies are to be put to death for the glory of God. Now, I don't mean that we're supposed to kill our bodies, that we're not supposed to uh, commit suicide, but, with, but the, the meaning here is that we are to control our minds out of our bodies and our passions rather than allow, allowing them to control us. Paul writes in, in chapter 9, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians, but I keep my body and bring it to subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 
In other words, he's warning the others and he's warning himself that if he, we do not control our bodies and our passions, that those bodies and passions will be controlling our mind and our spirit. My last point, though, the temple was a place of display. I don't know if we can actually picture what the temple uh, that Solomon built actually looked like. I don't think we can realize the beauty that was created in that place because it was built and to be, to, that it might be seen as a manifestation of God's glory. I've read that it, set, it faced east on the highest point in Jerusalem. And when the sun rose upon it, it the gold covering literally blazed in the glory of the sun, blazed in glory when the sun rose upon it. Beloved, our bodies as temple of the Lord are to reflect, reflect the manifestation of the power and the grace of God Almighty. Christ tells us, speaking of our bodies and our spirit, ye are the light of the world. Remember, Jerusalem, the temple was built, and when the sun arose upon it, it was a light unto the world. A city that is on a, tent, on a hill cannot be hid. But for us, whether it's day or night, our temple is to be always, or our, our temple of God is to always be a light or reflecting the glory of God. We are to be such reflectors of the glory of God that men can see his power working in and through our lives. We are to be those shiny examples of his power and of his saving grace. This might be my body. The body you're sitting in is yours. But our bodies are the temple of the high and most holy God. It is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And it is through that body that we are one with Christ. So this morning, I need to ask, and I'm going to ask you this time, and I'm asking myself at the same time, are we truly dedicated to Jesus Christ? Are we using our bodies to worship him in true devotion? Are we fully executing our duties before the Lord? Have we put those things to death in our lives that would dishonor Him? And are our lives a pleasing display to the saving grace of our Lord God? you to answer those questions to yourselves. What is our hymn of invitation? And as we say, if there's anyone here who would like to declare their love of God and unite themselves with the location called the Frank Primitive Baptist Church, and you would like to come declaring yourself a living sacrifice unto God, that opportunity is yours. 455.